Kangaroo. A quick thanks before we start the show. Filmmaking Confidential: The Book is now an Amazon.com and Audible.com bestseller. I just want to say thank you to all of you who ordered it and for your support. If you haven't yet picked it up and you want to learn my filmmaking secrets, Filmmaking Confidential is for you. It's available wherever books are sold in most countries around the world. Order by visiting Audible or Amazon. To find out more, check out filmmakingconfidential.com and stevebalderson.com. Thank you. I'm Steve Balderson, and you're listening to the Filmmaking Confidential podcast. In this podcast, we meet with filmmakers, writers, actors, artists, and other notables. Today's guest is Anthony Padoni. He has produced, written, directed, or shot over 24 feature films, documentaries, and shorts. In 2012, he founded the Victoria Independent Film Festival. In 2015, he produced The Strongest Man, which premiered at Sundance and was released theatrically and on VOD by Film Buff and Sundance Global. In 2018, his directorial debut, An American in Texas, won the Dutch Golden Stone Award at the CNEX Film Festival in Holland and was distributed by Gravitas Worldwide. Most recently, he produced HBO's One Nation Under Stress with director Mark Levin and Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Tell me about starting a film festival. Oh, starting a film festival. One of the weirdest things I ever did. It's like such a, uh, such a brazen reaction that is not being accepted to South by Southwest, you know, to just be like, fine, I'll start my own festival in your stupid town <laughs> and I'll run it. Right when your festival runs, I'll show you just like what a what a weird reaction. You know? Um you know, the Victoria Festival is different. The RXSM thing was just uh it's just a, a weird alignment of uh opening up your big mouth and then actually getting a chance to be able to cash the check your big mouth wrote. Uh that's how that happened and it was fun and was cool. Lost a bunch of money. I've met a ton of really, really, really great people and, you know, still have great relationships with those people today. The Victoria Festival was something much different. Uh, you know, it was more of, you know, we really wanted to try to do a, a, a real festival, you know, uh, where there would be filmmakers there who would travel there. The city would invest in that concept and, and provide uh, money to to do that and i had been working with the community theater acting and being on the board there in victoria texas and um they had gotten a grant from the city using the hotel occupancy funds and the structure under which those monies were available to the city to be utilized for creating art seemed to me very much like um making a movie i mean we've had all the same components uh you know eventually there would be uh there, there would be people that would come to town to go to work there would be people that would stay in hotels which was a big uh, uh, requirement of those funds was that people it had to put people in hotel rooms because the money that was being given to us was being generated through the hotel occupancy fund which comes with like a 17 to 20 percent bump on every hotel room uh, that money gets uh, bifurcated out of the out of the total of the room cost, and then that money is split up in the city, and a certain amount has to go to the arts. This was during the oil boom in 2011, 2010, 2011 in Texas. Uh, the fracking was blowing up, and so the, all of the hotels were full, and they were banging those oil companies 120 bucks a night for every room, and they would rent out entire floors or entire you know for all their workers eventually they get those man camps in place and that chills but for a while it's just a gold rush and the hotels just they just take advantage of it and so this is you know everybody knows everybody so you know a little bit trickles down to and i had i had i had identified this fund i had helped write the, the grant that got the 
theater the funds and i was like i'm gonna write this for film and so i wrote one for film i did a film camp proposal the whole thing and um they called me before the announcement. They said, come down to the office before we announce we want to talk to you. And I was like, okay. And I went down there to the city council and there was three or four of the city council members and they were like, uh, we're not going to give you the money. And, we, and, I, and I said, and they said, but we wanted to call you down here first because we, we don't want you to get upset and make a big deal. You know, we announce this tomorrow. We want to just tell you that you didn't get the money and you know, hope that you'll you know, because I'm an idiot. I'll go down there and I, they know um, I will raise hell. And they told me, you know, they were like, you don't, you don't have, the problem is, and this is what they, this is exactly what they told me, you don't have political clout. And I, they said, we think it's a great idea. We think it could probably work. But you don't have, and I was like, what does that even mean? And he said, you got to have somebody like a, you know, Robert Hewitt Jr. or Kay McCain, so, you know, these upper, you know, wealthy people who are philanthropic etc et et and i was like well these people do support us. and he said what do you mean and i said i can get robert hewitt jr on the phone right now uh he's a big supporter he uh you know, i work with him at the theater etc et so anyhow we, as soon as they heard that they they gave me the money and, and then we were just off to the races um you know i did have some really good community support there was a man that he liked the idea that we uh, we're a little weird and we were making movies and you know he thought that was cool and he had a bunch of money and he was kind of a black sheep guy and just one of, from one of these oil families and so he uh, also donated some money to the festival and then he continued to purchase gear for us that we made available to filmmakers that came to the festival and, uh, you know I think really the festival for me was just I had made a movie and at the very first festival I submitted to in France it got in and it was this funny little festival. I mean, there's probably like a dozen people at every screening. It was nothing. It's like some lady with DVDs and every finger running around a bar, is putting them on the DVD player, et cetera. But it was like, it was such a great experience. And I was like, I could recreate this. And I could, there's so many other, that's where I met Elizabeth, that very first festival. Uh, I met you shortly after, or, you know, before that, you know, like while I was making, I met you via, uh, you know, like MySpace or something. and. Uh, that was really exciting to me as a way to bring people because I was on probation. I had to be in bed at 10 o'clock every night. I had to be inside because I had just gotten out of prison. So all through those years, like those early years, I had a curfew. So it was like, how was I going to become a filmmaker unless I brought all the filmmakers there and I met them? And so I got the city to support that. And for the first two or three years, they, uh, you know, they gave uh, one year, they gave almost $90,000. Um, and then we started getting too weird for them and then that caused problems. And then it became more fun to wonder what the festival was up to and that, where's the money going than it was to even talk about the movies anymore for them. And it just became, it just became a dumb thing. And it was, it sucked. Did you say, so, how, who's running it now? Nobody. It's pretty much over. Oh, it's gone. Yeah. Well, I have you to thank for one of the most strange and surreal and awesome experiences I have ever had in my life. <laughs> and that is introducing me to Rutger Hauer and meeting Rutger Hauer at the Olive Garden Bro, over, the in, <laughs> over the endless that, br basket of breadsticks. That Olive Garden story when he gets... Uh, Lewis Black to buy everybody dinner at Olive Garden is is epic. It is one of the greatest. I love telling that story. It is such a great story to be at tell Olive me, Garden. Yeah, tell me the story from your side. Uh, I, mean, I know like, it, but tell us, tell us the story because I have a my perspective of from where I was sitting. I mean, I on one side, you know, I had Jane Beadland on one side and Rutger Hauer and his wife on the other. And I'm sitting at the head of the table and I'm like, this is the strangest, weirdest experience I've had <laughs> ever. I mean, just the fact that like you're at Olive Garden with Rudger Hauer in Victoria, Texas, like that's what they had to offer him. You know what I mean? Like that alone, that's the story. That's, a, that's my, it's like closing night dinner 
was at Olive Garden with Redger Hauer and Lewis Black, the founder of South by Southwest. That's so insane. Yeah, prior to Lewis knowing that I was the guy that started RXSM. We're good now. Me and him, we're good. We uh, we buried the hatchet in Poland one year. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what a weird thing. What a weird day that was. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, that, that is, that's, that's the thing, Steve, is that there are a lot of really great memories from that festival in Victoria for the people of Victoria and for the filmmakers. It just, like anything like that, anytime you involve city money and you open yourself up for scrutiny and scrutiny is a great story. And then, and then when you respond, like a guy like me does, I'm, I'm the class the guy to go after like that. Cause I just, you know, I'll get in there and respond to everybody. You know, I'll challenge a city council member to come down to the thing, uh, to the town square and count up all the receipts and, if it don't match, they can punch me in the face. But if I do get all the money back, then I get to punch them in the face in front of everybody. I do stuff like that. It's a problem, you know? I mean, I had people say things that, you know, I took offense to at the time, but I did at the time also understand what they were com- where they're coming from. It's like everything was great about the festival. It just really needed somebody, you know, besides me to run it. But there's nobody capable of that in Victoria. Or there wasn't somebody that, you know, understood what a festival was or had the connections to do that. Yeah, you know, you don't need your donors here and you tell everybody you'll punch them in the face or whatever. (laughs) Well, but okay, that all aside, there's a trait that you and I share, which is knowing that if you have somebody else do it, you're just going to have to do it yourself anyway. It is true. Do you think that was learned or just innately in you? Um, I've grown up in small towns like you and you do have to do it yourself. There, there is no there is no industry like i'm in la now you're in la now but like you didn't i mean you came out here but like you really didn't start here you actually came here and then you went home to actually start because you were like this is like what i can do this at home uh it's such a waste of money i'm like i'm pissing away all the money i could use to actually just go do the thing um we're used to doing that and i was just raised i was raised on a fucking ranch dude they i work my ass off work is not uh confusing to me i know that that's what you're like really supposed to do just drive and drive and drive and that's how you get where you're supposed to go and do you th- do you think that work ethic is something that you have to have been raised with or can you learn it later you can you can love something so much that you'll do anything to get it but i i do think that if you already have a good work ethic, then you're like, okay, I already know how to, I know what to do to get uh, the thing that I'm just passionate about, you know, the, the passion or the inspiration or the, the joy that you, or the bliss that you take from the things that you're making or the things that you're, you know, whatever you're passionate about, you're, if you have work ethic, then it's easy to jump on the path. You know that, I mean, you know, that's the, that's what you have to do to get anything that you have to work. But, um, you know, the longevity part of having to like, do it for 10 years to be worth a shit at it or to at least have like dug out far enough where people have been like god this fucking guy again you know like they keep pushing you down and you keep popping up and it's like finally they're just like fuck all right whatever come on you're in the first room you know you're at a major festival or you get an award whatever and then it's like yeah you know you do your best work and they're like (laughs) steve yeah Steve, it's great, but it's not what our donors want. Right. Um, yeah. So I know I think I think uh, you know work ethic obviously is. is uh, I mean that's you got to have it. You got to have it. You you either you either don't ever have it and it's stored up in you and you're just waiting to find this thing and then it happens and you're like fuck yeah and you just explode and. All of a sudden, you're you're dedicated, but I I do think that it's like you have to. I mean, even thinking back to like when I wanted to play music or was playing music and just like washing dishes in the most miserable situations and just like being like whatever, whatever, we go home and play later and just being like mindlessly doing those jobs and trying to make them most tolerable as possible just to get home and play again with your dudes or whatever, you know, playing your band. What are you most passionate about? I mean, I, you know, 
10 years ago, I would have just been like, filmmaking. <laughs> but it's, it's so much bigger than that now, you know, after, you know, continuing to be, you know, a filmmaker or producer or whatever, or help put things together for people or, but while running a restaurant or just deciding I'm going to run a restaurant and, um, you know, creating a new network of friends through that. And like, it's bigger than film and, and art as far as like what I'm, I'm, what I'm passionate about now. I think, I mean, I think that's just like one of the mediums in which I'm able to reach people or connect with people um, in a meaningful way. I mean, it's always fun to make a movie, even when it's fucking crazy. Like the, that's if you've got some people with a great sense of humor around you, that's sometimes even better because it's kind of a it's kind of a test, you know, and it's also just like a great personality obstacle course for people, too. And I think that I. Uh, I get into that a lot more these days too, just like trying to navigate situations without creating them if that makes sense i mean these are finite aspects of like what uh drives me or, or makes me passionate but i think ultimately it's just like i really like i just like to make people happy i want people to be happy uh and making films is a way of doing that um helping people make their films where you don't even have to be the one making i mean just as a COVID officer that's been kind of cool to be able to help people uh in the same way that i help first-time filmmakers uh you know somebody who has a fully good you know somebody that knows how to make a film but is like COVID, fuck when it first happened like i mean we're all pretty much pros at it now but when it first happened a lot of people were just looking and everybody had little bits of information and so to try to like process all that and create a business um it was a fun challenge and it also gave me an opportunity to help people sort through uh the things that were keeping them from creating so that you know even even helping in that one little bit uh it, it felt good you know i mean it, i i can compare stuff like this like just people would call like you've called me a couple of times like hey what do you think about this antigen test and i'll tell you and you'll be like cool later and it's like it it feels like making a hamburger. You know what I mean? It's like this, there's like this tiny little joy that happens when you pull that ticket out of the window. You know, you get your order, you, you put it up in the window, you make your little hamburger, it's all pretty, you put it back in the window and you pull that ticket down and you put it on the thing and it's kind of like, it's just a little achievement. I don't know why I didn't use, I mean, I guess I've always sort of shared the secrets. I've never held them dear. I've always sort of said, hey, you know, had I, I wish I had known this you know, 15 years ago. So I'm going to tell it to you today and it's no big deal to me. I, I'm happy to tell you because I don't want you to go down that path and get screwed over like I did. Right. Um, but there was one, I mean, there are sometimes when, you know, if you tell the kid, don't touch the burner because you're going to burn your hand. If they haven't already done it, they don't even know what that means. So then it's like, they touch the burner and burn their hand to say, Oh, that's what they're talking about. Yeah. Right. So it's like, there are some things I've, I've advised, you know, first time filmmakers and they don't really take the advice, <laughs> um, but I still love sharing it. I'm the same way. I'll, I'll, sometimes I get out, to, you know, after, I'll, sometimes I'll send people LLC paperwork that would or like $5,000 lawyer shit that they would do. And I send it out and I'm just kind of like, after I hit send, I'm like, damn, I should have. I, I mean, I probably could ask 300 bucks for that, you know? like, but I just, I do stuff like that all the time. You know, I, uh, I do, I want to, I want to see other people. I want other people to get as much out of it as I got. Like, yeah. I feel like I was really lucky. I mean, I, you, you know, you make a movie with a fucking HP 20 and meet people on MySpace, and, you know, you write a, write a movie like what we wrote, the why I mean, like what a fucking ridiculous movie, but to like do that, and be able to uh, navigate that to, uh, you know, where we both are sitting here right now with that uh, 15 years later, almost. Uh, I mean, that's what a weird decision. <laughs> no, what a weird decision to just make. Uh, I'm going to be a filmmaker. And um, but what a great world that technology allows that. And 
how lucky are we to have had that stuff at our disposal? Anthony Padoni. Another great filmmaking confidential guest is Polish actor Marek Probosz. You need to transform yourself and psych yourself up to the extent that when the curtain goes up, you blind the audience with the light that you possess within you. And that's the truth. That's the flow of truth. You can hear my full interview with Marek at filmmakingconfidential.com in our archives or by subscribing for free to this podcast. We'll be right back with Anthony Padoni. Stay with us. I'm Steve Balderson, and this is the Filmmaking Confidential Podcast. I'm back with Anthony Padoni. I mean, I did. I directed Firecracker in 2003. Yeah, I didn't get out till 2006. Okay, and it was around that time that the cameras were starting to look more like film. Yeah. And it was just sort of that middle cross. So when you went into it, it was already there. The, the why I was using a handy cam, but I had fashioned a focusing lens inside of a styrofoam cup and used ring adapters to connect AE1 lenses to the HV20 and shoot with D- DSLR lenses, but shoot upside down because of the mirror flips the image. But I made a focusing ring out of PVC pipe, styrofoam cup, and uh, uh, step down rings to go to the HB20 to a A1 zoom lens. And then right after that, when I did the uh, camp casserole, that's when the T2i or T21 or whatever, it just came out. It was the first TSLR that shot video and it shot HD video uh, and it had the lenses. And that was the first, that was the first thing I ever shot with a, uh, a DSLR. It's so great. I love that that happened for the world. Um, oh, it, was, it was huge. I mean, but it was bound to happen. I mean, but it, what it, we, man, we hit the lotto. We were right at the right time. Totally. All right. Tell me about prison. Do you want to talk about it or no? <clears throat> no, I mean, sure. It's, I mean, how do you not? It's free low hanging <laughs> fruit. You know what I mean? Um, and it's probably a different version at this point in my life. Uh, I mean, it was something that was just, it was just necessary, you know, in that way that I, you know, it, I don't want to be a cliche, but it, you know, it really did save me even though I fucking relapsed and got hooked on heroin again while I was in there and didn't always utilize that time to the best that I could. I mean, I did a lot. I went back to school. I did a lot of stuff. I taught GED, but, you know, fucked up a lot too in there. And um, I just really wasn't sure what the fuck I was going to do when I got out. And you can only put that off and, you know, behind the prison prison posturings and, you know, still coming to terms with the fact how you pretty much deuced out on your kids and, you know, chose to do the things you did that would get you locked up in there and listen to a thousand other inmate stories, you know, 10% of them who you really care about, the other 90%, some of the dumbest fucking saddest people, you know, I, it's, I don't mean dumb like them. It's just like, it's just, they're in the worst situation and there is no hope for them. It's their the recidivism is, it's so obvious when you're in there. Like you know why people keep coming back. It's just like, what is this guy going to do? You know, he gets out, they give him 50 bucks and the bus ticket. <laughs> it's enough to just go <laughs> right back in here. Uh, you know, it saved me. I was fucked. That's fucked up. Um, but, you know, what, what really saved me, what is really clear to me now, um, was that when Stephen, you know, my friend Stephen Floyd came out 
about three months before I was released and I was dope sick on heroin. Three months to the gate. Knew I was going to go back to Victoria and work as a copier salesman. <laughs> which was sounded horrible. <laughs> like, uh, but it was, you know, in the end, it wasn't. It was a great thing. It allowed me, afforded me a lot of opportunities to chase the dream of, you know, making movies at a 37 years old when I should have had no more chances and no more opportunities. You know, I, my family stood by me and, and provided me with more opportunities, you know, and that, that was really what saved me. But uh, prior to getting out, Steve McCloyd came out there and had been working for Apple for a long time. And, uh, you know, it was like, you know, what are you going to do when you get out? Like, I'm going to go work for my dad. I'm going to sell copies. And uh, he was like, well, you know, whenever you stop playing music, you know, you, that's when you started to really kind of fuck up. And so I don't know if you thought about, you know, if you're doing anything like that. And I was like, are you? Did you come over here to ask me to be in a band with you when I get out of here? Because if that's what's going on right now, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. And I was like, I'm not going to fucking be in a band. He's like, no, dude, I'm, shut up. I'm not asking you to be in a band. And I was like, what in the fuck are you talking about? And he was like, we should make a movie. <laughs> and I was like, that's dumber than being in a band. I was like, how are we going to make a movie? Dude, that takes money. I was like, I've got fucking Chuck Taylors and some kickies and uh, maybe a photo album or two. And that's it. I don't have anything. And I'm going to go sell copiers in Victoria, Texas. And that's probably going to be it. And um, I was like, no, man, you don't understand. Uh, there's, you know, David Lynch shoots on digital and and I'd already known that, but it, that's David Lynch. It's whatever. That's not the point. Uh, he can do whatever. Uh, and he's like, no, man, I promise you in, in five, 10 years, there won't even be film cameras. It'll all be digital. I have all this uh, not for resale software that I have from Pro Tools training. I'll let you have it. You used to have this music recording software. It's like the same stuff. It's just video. It's like the same tools. You'll be able to do it. Uh, have you been writing? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, well, let's make a movie. And I was like, okay. okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, it's just kind of, I mean, I, fuck, I, they barely had camera phones when I went in. So I, all of this is like, I'm sure. I mean, I know we had video cameras, but they always look like shit. Um, which ironically now it's like everybody making documentaries. That's what everybody wants is old video footage camera. The other day I watched the DMX doc and they're like shooting with a small camera to like give a different medium look as, as if it were archival. But, and we totally did the same thing on my doc. It's going to be cheated some archival. Anyhow, whatever prison uh, filmmaking. Yeah. So I got out and he gave me all the software and, I discovered MySpace and met people and wrote a movie and met you. And here we are. Now I'm fucking making a series for PBS. It's amazing. <laughs> so weird. Um, tell me about your movies. If you look at the credit list, it's pretty elaborate. Uh, and I don't feel like I had such a huge role in so many of them, you know. Um, so much of what I do is just like putting people together and I don't know, I guess it's all just producing, but you know, a lot of times I don't have a lot of creative input on these things. It's, you know, gear or support or I'll go work or help them get actors. I don't know, whatever. Uh, the ones that I've been, I, you know, I've been doing a lot of doc stuff lately. That's, I've kind of got pulled into that. Uh, from being in Victoria, uh, programming docs. Uh, there was a statistic that uh, Victoria had one of the highest increases in mortality rates of women ages 35 to 55. So I got an opportunity to field produce on an HBO doc and find a uh, woman in that demographic who was struggling with uh, addiction. Uh, and I knew 
several people. That's my that's my demographic, you know, thirty five to fifty five. Uh, and um, yeah, I got a chance to field produce, and got asked to do something else, and then got asked to direct this prison reform doc. So I, I've really been loving working in that space. Uh, but I miss, I also miss features. I, I'm working on one right now uh, called the adult. Well, not working on it. I just put some financing together for it uh, called the adults. It's directed by Dustin Defa. It's Michael Sarah in it. They just finished shooting it. Uh, then I did a, feature in salt lake city that was in tribeca a year or so ago and then same year we did one in victoria that was a slam dance at here called sanzaru and the heart can't beat my heart can't beat unless you tell it to is the whole title so we we say heart can't beat but uh those you know those are those are just like it's just the same space i've always worked in you know it's under 200 ultra low budget uh kind of have that kind of down to the science you know always done those i've never done like a million dollar budget from the sarah film is it but i i'm not really on that like i said i just made some financing connections and that's it that's really the biggest budget i've worked on but i like like i said i'm not even there well um, my always... movies, I, don't, I don't know how do you talk about your movies i like just it's like bastard kids now <laughs> Well, no, that's exactly what I think of my movies are like children, you know? So it's like, you know, I could tell you all the different genres and, you know, I've done this tone, that tone and whatever, but I, they don't, you know, they, I, they are how they are themselves. Well, and so I guess I would narrow it down and say like, as far as my films, I mean, I, I look at, you know, at this doc I'm doing, uh, I feel like, you know, it's pretty much my film, even though I, I don't own it, but I'm the one that, you know, kind of pulled the story together in the way that it is and created the elements or, you know, whatever the, uh, the ones I direct, I feel like I'm a little more attached to. Um, I think not having social media makes me feel less attached because I'm not posting about it, you know? Yeah. Hey, my film's playing at this place, and I haven't been on social media in a couple of years, so I haven't done that. So I have like a, I have less of that feeling. Like I'm more attached to the, uh, in the moments that we're making them, I'm really attached to it, and um, because there's other directors that like the, you know, the John who directed Heart Can't Beat, and you know, Zai who directed Sanzaru, they, you know, they are really active on social media. So like they, I, I don't have that same feedback loop that continues to make me feel connected in a way that um god i feel like this sounds crazy i don't know i'm just like it i'm always happy for I, i'm i'm more happy about those people's successes as their movies are being done for them as directors than i am for like whatever my input may have been and how i would call that my film mm, you know sure yeah I, i'm less likely to feel like heart can't beat is my film because like i you know i help i make food brought the camera and stuff that isn't it, it uh i mean it, that's a part of it it's a big part of it but it's uh it, it doesn't like the ones that are i don't know i'm probably getting too granular on this huh <laughs> <laughs> no, no it's good tell me about your movies is a little broad i should have made it more specific but what i what i got out of it was your interest and appreciation for documentary, which I think is interesting. You can't just say cut. I'm not buying that because it's real and there it's, it's a real thing. Right. So you nailed, tell, it. The, the, you nailed it right there. It takes off all the pressure, man. You, you don't need to yell cut. You're not supposed to. It just happens. And then you get to take home all the footage and then you get to figure it out. Is that and, you just film everything you can? I mean, not it. That that's a reckless way to say it, but uh, I don't pass up opportunities. But if I would like to think that I recognize when I don't need them, 
<laughs> for for instance, on the Weldon documentary that I'm doing right now, uh, we have a, a a pretty good cut. I mean, it's not a final cut. It's a it's a first cut with some notes from Village Roadshow. But when we were trying to figure out the end, like w- Weldon had he had gotten out. He you know first of all he had gotten 55 years of selling weed. Then he had raised enough attention about himself where he had gotten out kind of mysteriously, and he was going to be an activist. And it's like we you know we kind of cut that together and we're like okay but you're not an activist yet you know what i mean so it's like okay we're gonna we're gonna have to wait till you're an activist so go go be an activist and that's a weird that's like weird to be like okay we're at this point in our movie and it's like this isn't really the end and so we wait and we just wait and see and something comes up and we're like all right do we film that let's give it a try and they just came to where i would just go by myself so she's cheaper i just go with a camera and a mic and you know, pl- pl- plot around with all my stuff and look like a, an idiotic tourist or whatever with a bunch of camera stuff. And we see what we would get. Or we would be like, okay, now this is a big deal. Let's have two cameras. We'll have a director. But you get to shape those things. Um, you make those decisions as you go based on what you have and what you think the story is going to be. And you start to, uh, I mean, we, we it's weird, Steve. Like we, 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 I kept telling Weldon, I was like, dude, you need to get a part. All these other fucking idiots are getting pardons. If you could get a pardon, that would be the ultimate ending. Like you get pardoned, you finally get pardoned. So then he does get a pardon, and we're like, "Holy shit!" And they're like, "But wait, but wait, he's going to get Harry O a pardon, the guy that founded Death Row Records, and we're going to get Trump to get the biggest, you know, the the OG gangster that gave Suge Knight the money. We're going to get Trump to get him out." and give him a pardon and Weldon's going to work with Snoop and the Koch brothers to do it. And I was like, okay, well, we'll film that. <laughs> we'll wait. We'll wait another eight months. If that, like, if that's really real. And it, so the, that's the fun part because you, it's just watching the natural development of things. It almost feels like a, what it must be to be a day trader, you know, where you're like watching the, you know, like you watch the trends and the, you know, is this going to really happen or what is this going to mean if we go do this? Does he really elevate his game as an activist or is this just like really great B-roll or is he going to get in the White House? Like all of those things, uh, you know, it, it's it's really challenging. It's fun. You know, it's problem solving. And uh, it's fun to have real story elements that you're moving around like check chess pieces and you have like this fresh influx of you know, chances, new, new game pieces. It's, it's really fun. I, you know, I hadn't thought about it so much uh, as, as I am right now as to why, but I, I think that is a lot of it. You know, it's, it's kind of like dice, you know, you, you, uh, you get to roll the dice, you get a new number and you're like, Hmm, where does this fit in? And it, you know, it's, it hits a lot of those uh, bells. Who have been some of the favorite people you've worked with? Besides from uh, me. <laughs> okay. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> of course you. I met so many great people through you and had such a good experience on Cast World Club. That was so much fun, man. What is it? What a great second movie to make. You know, it was my second time making films and, um, God, just had such a good time. Uh, I love tell, tell everybody what you were doing that I didn't even know about until way, way afterwards. What was I doing? Well, you were all making short films every oh. night, and I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, we were making Pyrex commercials, homages to pirate, to uh, old films. We made Pyrex of the Lambs. Uh, we did a shot-for-shot shot remake of the shower scene from Psycho, and uh, Garrett murdered with a uh, casserole pan, a Pyrex casserole pan, with the silhouette looked like a knife blade of the, can, of the pan. Um, we did. Uh, Pyrex of the Lambs was the best. Uh, for sure, oh, was. And, there was, and Mommy Dearest with uh, Susan Trailer as the little girl, and Jane as uh, as the mom. Jane put her eyebrows on with a gigantic sharpie that night. <laughs> uh, so good, so good. I mean, man, those are those are the things I want other people to experience. You know, people are always like, "You going to stay at the crew house?" No. Y'all are going to stay at the crew house, but I hope you have the greatest of times. You know, uh, I had my good times back then. I, I love working with Kenny. Uh, I, I, he's just a, he's a really good guy. 
uh, he, you know, like you is, you know, has his very own thing. He is not really interested in making other people's movies or directing commercials or doing whatever, like he's into making his movies his way on his terms. And, uh, so I enjoy working with him in that same way that I enjoyed working with you. Uh, I really liked working with John, uh, who did uh, Heart Can't Beat because I doubted him a lot during the process. He just doesn't shoot a lot of coverage and uh, he's, you know, very soft spoken uh, and very, seemed very sure about what he wanted, but that was kind of scary because I was watching what he was getting. I was like, all right, we're going in next. And they're like, okay, move on, moving on. And I'm like, there's no coverage or whatever. And so I expressed some real concern about it. And Kenny was like, we may have to come back and shoot something. And I was like, okay. Uh, but I mean, he just, John had a vision and he, uh, you know, he really rode with it. And I, I, you know, once you experience that with somebody, then it's like, it's a real relief. You know, you, you can really just do your job. You don't have to, as a producer, you can just make sure these things are available and that the creative part, is taken care of. I mean, so I, I, uh, I really appreciate that about him. Um, doc stuff. Mark Levin is just, you know, he's the godfather of documentaries. The guy's done a million of them. And so working with him, there's always just that sense of somebody that knows exactly what they're doing and, uh, you know, kind of where your lane is and you have opportunities to give, you know, valuable input that, that shapes the project and creates other opportunities so working with him has been also really fantastic have you ever been inspired by something that provoked a, something that you created it's a tough question steve <laughs> <laughs> uh shit these are, they really are tough questions because they involve they i mean they almost require meditation you know it's like uh I love to watch people learn and like see their potential or I love for people to be relieved of the burdens of themselves or to like, you know, man, I, I was going to bring this up earlier, but just making things heals us. And I just want people to know that. And uh, I know it just sounds plain, but it, it it really does heal. And in the general sense, not like the single thing that ails you, but just everything uh, is better when you're making stuff. And so what inspires me is to see people believe that or experience that. Um but to believe it like that, I mean, when you see people experience it and then believe it and be able to regenerate that for themselves or feel successful or uh, achieve something or pull that little ticket, you know, like I said, I just like that. It can be that simple, you know. I just love to see people complete things and make things and help people do that. So that's kind of what inspires me, I think, is to, to feel that feeling, you know? Filmmaker Anthony Pedoni. Tune in next time for more Filmmaking Confidential. It is totally free to subscribe. And when you subscribe, you'll get upcoming new episodes automatically. And you'll have free access to all our past shows. The Filmmaking Confidential podcast is a production of Dekanga Audio and produced by myself and Ella Spencer. Our original theme music is composed by Kevin Robles. For more of the Filmmaking Confidential podcast, head over to filmmakingconfidential.com. If you have a question about filmmaking you'd like me to answer on the podcast, send me an email using the contact form on the website. To learn more of my filmmaking secrets, be sure to pick up a copy of the book, Filmmaking Confidential, available on Audible, paperback, and ebook, wherever books are sold. I'm Steve Balderson. 
Thanks for listening and spreading the word. Until next time, keep making, keep doing, keep going. Thank you.